Come on in, find a seat. Welcome to church this morning. New year, new things going on here. We're going to start service just a little bit different way. My name's Kyle. If I've not had the chance to meet you, I'm the pastor here. And uh, we're starting service a little bit different way for a couple reasons. Uh, one is because we want to make sure once we start worship, we don't stop worship and we'll keep worship rolling. But also, I know there's something we've done in the past that was a fan favorite, and we haven't done it in a while. And we did, when we'd bring somebody up, we'd interview them for five questions because it was somebody that you guys might not have known, right? And so I want to invite up my friend Nate, he right over here. Nate, come on up. So Nate, give Nate a round of applause while he's walking up here. There we go. All Nate did was walk up here, but that's a pretty good round of applause for just walking. Hey, so here's why Nate's up here. So Nate and uh, Amanda and I have done ministry uh, together for a couple years now. And in the process of doing ministry together, uh, God is leading our paths back to do ministry together. And so Nate uh, currently lives in Indianapolis and makes a nice little drive every Sunday to be here. Uh, but he's working on getting his way up north permanently. And uh, we, I want you guys to get to know Nate because you guys are going to see Nate around here, um, obviously, every Sunday. But if you're here involved throughout the week, once he gets moved up here, he'll be helping us around with a lot of things here. And I wanted to just take a second and we're going to do a little interview with Nate. He doesn't know any of you, so he's super uncomfortable right now. <laughs> and I know a lot about Nate, and so I hold a lot of power, but I won't do anything to you right now. Uh, the first question is not even a question, it's a statement. Just tell us about yourself. Tell us about where you're from. Tell us about your family. Help us get to know you a little bit. First of all, my name is Jim, not Nate. I don't know <laughs> got that notion. Uh, my name is Nate Salazar, and I live uh, out in Fishers, like you said, so I trek up here every week. Um, a little bit about myself. I travel the state for Verizon, and I fix stores doing that, and then also um, with ministry and things like that. I got to meet Kyle two years ago. Um, I grew up as a pastor's kid, uh, so as a military brat, my dad retired from the military, became a pastor down in Indianapolis, so I've gotten to go all over the world with him while he's preached at different uh, places, different churches, and uh, like everybody from this church, and the reason why uh, I felt really called to this church was I got to do the same thing you guys did. Coming out of the United Methodist thing, we were independent Baptists for 
man, forever. It's all I've ever known. And so my church that I grew up in looked exactly like this one. You can ask Kyle when he brought me to the church for the first time. I was like, oh my word, like this is home just <laughs> two hours north. So it felt, <laughs> felt really different um, to go uh, from there to here. And I love it so much. It just feels like home again. Yeah. So tell us, what was, what was harder, being a military kid or a PK? Oh, PK for sure. Why? Um, because as a military kid, you could be a brat. Um, but uh, being a pastor's kid, you know, it's, the, it's, the, it's amazing as a teenager and even in Bible college, I would have told you uh, being a um, pastor's kid was the worst thing in the world. Like, I didn't like it because I didn't choose it. Um, being uh, a kid not in ministry, you can kind of choose what you want to be. But being in ministry, everybody expects you to be like your parents or even just to be perfect all the time. So we didn't get to have an all out drag out fight unless nobody was looking. So it felt fake. Um, but then at church, it was like, you know, you yell at each other in the car and like, hey, everybody be good. Dad's pastor. And so you just turn it right back on and everything's amazing. But then you have live in a fishbowl. Everybody sees you all the time. They know you, even though you don't know anybody. Even when I went to college, I met my two roommates. They're like, oh, hey, you're Nate. And I'm like, what? I don't know any of you guys, but they yeah. knew us. So it was you know, great now, but awful then. What do you feel like is in the ministry realm is, what do you feel like God's calling you to in the ministry realm? Talk about that. Um, I love to do, uh, I mean, a lot of everything in ministry. I went to college to be a youth pastor, and so that's what I studied, and that's where I felt God put my heart in. But after getting to work with Kyle in ministry for the first time, I loved just being an associate, being able to help, being able to come alongside him and support him more in different roles of ministry in the church and kind of be a jack of all trades. That's what um, God really pulled me to and helped me learn over the last two years behind Kyle. I was able to serve uh, behind Kyle for the last year and a half ish. Yeah. So, so that's what I've enjoyed the most. Cool. All right. And then the last question, which everybody always wants to know is have you had a zum stick? What is a zum stick? Yeah, he had no idea that question was coming. He doesn't even know. Do you know what a zum stick is? No, I've never heard uh, of a zum stick. All right, well, you can go sit down then because. <laughs> no. A zum stick is it's a thing that we use here. It's like, somebody help me out because I've only had one in my life. It's apple, banana, pi- pineapple, banana, marshmallow. Okay, covered in chocolate. So, health and not health. That sounds amazing. It's dark chocolate. It's got antioxidants. There you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so, it's just all sorts of things. <laughs> It's just all sorts of things that people love, and we sell them at the fairs, and it's a fundraiser uh, for the church. And so that was, what do you say? It is the healthiest thing at the fairs. So it's, um... Is Zoom the Z-U-M thing? Yeah. I've been pronouncing it Zoom. No, it's um, (laughs) Zoom. Zoom. Cool. He's got a long way to go, guys. Give him some grace in this season. He'll figure it out. You can go sit down, though, for real this time. Yeah, give Nate one more round of applause. All right, so... One announcement before we hop into worship and pray. Uh, we have Upward starting uh, this week. And so Upward, we have 160 kids either in basketball or cheer who will be coming in to this place. So 160 kids and their families will be coming in here at least once a week. Yeah, which is amazing. And uh, we're just super excited, obviously, for the kids and for the families to be able to have something um, to do as far as basketball or cheer, but honestly, if it's only basketball and cheer, then we're missing our role as the church to come alongside them and help them grow in their faith journey as well. And so uh, that starts this week, but what I want to do is as we get ready to worship, I want to pray to get our hearts right for worship, but I also want to pray and cover upward as well and that outreach that we're doing as a church. And so if you'd bow your heads, we'll pray together. Father, we... uh, We just thank you for who you are, God, for the character of who you are and how good you are. God, we just um, ask that as we're here in your presence today, Lord, that you soften our hearts. God, that whatever we've walked through this week, God, whatever we're battling, whatever it is that we've allowed to become bigger than you, God, that we can just put you back at your rightful place in our life. God, that we can allow you to be on the throne of our heart. God, that we can allow you to put the things of this world in perspective. God, that no matter what it is we're walking through, you're bigger than that. God, we pray for upward as it starts that, God, you would already have divinely appointed which families are part of the upward program. God, which families are going to be walking in the doors. God, we ask for 
your wisdom for the coaches and the referees and the people in the concession stands, God, and everybody who's serving at Upward in any capacity, God, we ask that we could be the best ambassadors for you that we could ever be. God, that people don't see us, but they see you through each and every one of us, God, and they want something that we have. God, they, they see something's different about us, and they, they say, man, I want that. God, we pray that the gospel isn't, doesn't stop with us, God, but it can be flowing through us, God, to other people. God, that the people who walk in here don't walk out of here without having a chance to have heard how good you are and the price that you paid when you sent your son to the cross. God, we thank you for all the work that's been put in behind the scenes and that will be put in by the people serving upward, God. We just ask, Lord, that you give them strength, give them joy, allow them to just exude your love. God, we just ask that as we worship today, we can worship you, and it's glorifying to you. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, let's stand, let's worship together. No, great.
Goldman is in the back ready to welcome them to TLC Kids. You can send them back. Yeah. 
Amen. Isn't that such a powerful prayer? If we can really get to the place where all that we want is all that he is. If the only thing we desire is more of him, how powerful is that for us? Right? We don't want more of the world. We don't want more of ourselves. We don't want more of our spouse or our family or whatever. We want more of him. And in the middle of getting more of him, it's amazing how all those other things that we thought we wanted kind of fade away. All those other things that we thought were so necessary, all those other things that we thought could fix it, all those other things that we thought, whatever it is, we are the humans who thought we could do it. And we find out we can't, and we need more of him. And in the middle of getting more of him, we have to humble ourselves and get to the place of, hey, will you meet me here again? And again implies that he's done it before. And at some point from the time that he did it before until we're asking him to do it again, we said, let me take it from your hands, God. I can do it on my own. And we realized, I can't do it on my own. I need you. So will you meet me here again? Because I need you. I can't do it. And so that's our prayer for today. If you guys would bow your heads, we'll pray that together. Father, we, uh, we invite you into this place because we know we can't do it without you. Whatever it is that each and every one of us has taken out of your hands, put back into ours. God, we're just going to go ahead and just undo that. We're going to give it right back to you. Because we know we can't do it. That's why we're coming back to you saying, hey, I need you again. Show up one more time. God, we ask that this time as we walk back to you, God, with whatever it is, God, that we don't try to take it back from you. God, this time it's in your hands for good. God, well, yes, we aren't enough without you. With you, we are exactly enough. God, we ask for the rest of the time that we have together. God, that you would just allow your word to sink into our hearts, God, that anything that I say that's not from you would be forgotten, God, but what's from you for each and every person, Father, would take root in their heart, God, would grow as it lands in fertile ground. God, we ask for all distractions to be silenced. God, we ask for it just to be us with you. We thank you that we live in a country where we can pursue you and be in church on Sundays and worship you in your holy name. We thank you again for who you are. God, we thank you for how good you are. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. How are we all doing? We have a good new year? Everybody had a good new year? Very good. Half of you did at least. Hey, I'm super excited to be back. And uh, we had an amazing message last week from Garrett. If you guys were here last week, Garrett brought the word. And he brought just such a special energy and uh, it was so nice to be able to sit and just be ministered to by Garrett and um, he's our youth coordinator and he and Jamie are doing a fantastic job leading our youth and our youth are actually kicking back off again tonight, uh, 6th to 12th grade tonight at 6 o'clock, 6 to 7.30 here, 6th to 12th grade students uh, come on out and we are going to be kicking off our weekly youth meetings again and so youth night is tonight, 6 to 7.30 for 6th to 12th grade students, okay? couple other things of housekeeping before we get into our brand new series, and I about forgot all, I've been a mess all morning, okay? So I was supposed to announce that kids were being dismissed before the first song, and then I get down there and they're like, uh, I don't think that you announced that kids were dismissed, and so I've about forgot all the announcements I had right now, so let me get those out of the way, because I'm really excited about this series that we're getting ready to start, okay? So, other announcements, on January 16th, so not next week, but the Sunday after, Right after service, we are doing uh, lunch for everybody. It's an all-church meeting. We want to get you guys updated on kind of how 2021 ended, the final quarter of that, how things have progressed, but then also talk about what are we doing going forward, what's the vision for 2022, kind of rolling that all out, getting all of us on the same page as a church, knowing what's coming forward so that we can all be on the same page, moving the ball down the field for Christ and getting the, the gospel to as many people as possible and pastoring people well and loving people well and So that's on January 16th. We'll have lunch provided for you right after service. Don't go anywhere besides from here uh, to either the fellowship hall or the gym. 
Uh, we'll, we'll let you know next week where it's going to be, but it's in this building right after service. Lunch provided for your whole family. And so stick around for that, and uh, we'll catch you guys up on how 2021 ended and what we got for 2022, okay? So we have that. We have youth tonight, and then my final housekeeping announcement is Tuesday night at 6 o'clock. If you're not doing anything, come help us take these Christmas trees down and pretend that Christmas didn't happen, and we're going to bring it all back to uh, the way that it was. And um, we're super excited to, yes, we celebrated Christmas, and now we get to go, and we get to do church for a whole year, and we want to take this place back to, from a forest out in the lobby and up on stage to the way that it was. And so the more hands that we have at Tuesday night at 6 o'clock, the better, and uh, it'll be super fun, and we'll make sure that we get you in and out quickly, and uh, we'll have a lot of fun while you're here, but we'd love as many people uh, who aren't at Upwards Practice that night to, uh, to be a part of that, okay? All right, housekeeping is done. Now, we can get into this new series because I'm super excited about this series that we're getting ready to start. This series is called Masquerade, and this is a series that a man and I have been talking through for uh, a couple months and just trying to figure out when it fit, and it didn't fit until now. Um, just with Christmas and all the things that we were doing as a church, it didn't fit until now, but I think January is a great time to talk about masquerade. And the idea behind masquerade is removing the mask. Because I think as Christians, we get really good at wearing a mask, right? We get not like the actual physical mask that COVID brought, but an actual mask that says, hey, I'm not allowing you to see the real me. If we look at masquerade in the dictionary, the definition for masquerade is a false show or a false pretense. And I think as Christians, we are really, really good at putting on this false show or a false pretense about who we are, what we're walking through, what's going on in our life, what we're battling, and just everything's just, I'm just blessed, you know? Thanks for asking, I'm blessed. People ask how you're doing, you're like, I'm too blessed to be stressed, too anointed to be disappointed. Right? And we're just like, I'm not talking about anything that's going on. Lockdown. This is like, this is like a prison cell, nothing in, nothing out without my permission. I'm just going to only allow you to see what I want you to see. And as Christians, we get going down this path and we think, well, because I'm supposed to be a Christian, I'm supposed to be living by the, what the Bible says, and all of that's true, that we can't be, I'm still working through my stuff. I still have this area in my life I'm trying to work out. I still have this thing that's going on. Right? And we feel like we can't be real with anybody because, you know what, we're like, I have to have this facade that I put on. I have to have this mask that I wear so that nobody can see why in the world I'm walking through the things I'm walking through or what I'm walking through or why I'm struggling in the way that I'm struggling because it's just, if people knew what I'm walking through, if people knew why I think that I have to have this mask on, if they really knew, if they really knew, would they love me? Would they treat me differently? Would I even be considered a Christian in their eyes? Like, could I even go to church? I certainly couldn't be on the worship team. Like, I certainly couldn't be in a small group. I couldn't lead anything, right? And all of a sudden, we start to disqualify ourselves thinking through this, the things that we're walking through. And all of a sudden, because of that, nobody gets to know anything. Just, it's not happening. It's not real. I'm just going to deal with my own things. And this idea about having this mask on, right? Because if you think about a masquerade ball, who knows what a masquerade ball is? Show of hands. Okay. We've, we were having a discussion with somebody earlier this week, and they're like, uh, like what's, a, what's a masquerade ball? Like, Ooh. I thought that, I, when we came up with this series, I think we thought that that would be a more commonly like, known thing. But a masquerade ball is one of those parties where people wear those masks that come on a stick, and they have these little masks that cover up their eyes, okay? And everybody's walking around, saying, hey, like, I'm not allowing you to see who I really am. And I think church becomes a lot like that sometimes, but instead of a physical mask that is temporary, it's a metaphorical mask that, if we're not careful, becomes permanent. It's a metaphorical mask that, if we're not careful, we're holding it here, and all of a sudden it just kind of sinks into our face and just becomes our identity, because for so long we just embodied that identity and we forgot the identity that God gave us, right? We believed what the world says about us, not what God says about us. And so as I was thinking through this series and we were talking about it, I just kind of was like, everybody's mask looks different, right? Like if you go to a masquerade ball, everybody's mask looks different. They're designed different. They're decorated different. Now they're all serving the same purpose. 
Every mask is designed to not allow you to see what's behind it. But every mask looks different. So we can't talk about everybody's mask. We can't talk about your individual mask, mine, everybody's, right? We only have four weeks in this series. It would take us two years to get through it with everybody here. But what we can talk about is why we wear masks. And I think talking about the mask isn't really, doesn't really do a ton of good if we don't talk about why we wear it anyways. And so I've, I think there's more than two reasons, but I've boiled it down to two. And we'll talk about one this week, one next week. I'm not telling you what next week is because you won't come back. Okay, so you have to come back to hear what next week's about. But this week we're talking about the reason we put on a mask we're going to talk about is shame. Shame. Why do I have shame? What is shame? Is shame from God? Is shame from something else? Is shame biblical? Is it not biblical? But the reason we put on a mask and we don't want other people to see sometimes is because of the shame that we carry around. And so as we kind of dive into shame, I started to, to look and see what the Bible said about shame, but the Bible doesn't say a ton about shame because shame's one of those things that, you know, it's, it's one of those things that it's hard to describe, but you know it when you feel it, right? Like if you said, what's the definition of shame? We all might have a little bit definition of shame, but I think everybody could identify when you're feeling ashamed, right? And I think that that's something that the, the world has kind of, has made shame common. The world has made shame popular, which if it's hard to find in the Bible and the world has made it popular, what does that tell us? Probably not from God, right? But the world has kind of made it because you hear people talk about, a lot of times they're talking about it with their kid, and we all experience shame in a different way, but sometimes when people have kids and they go up and they do something that the parents are kind of embarrassed of, they're like, oh my gosh, that one has no shame, right? They talk about, well, that one has no shame. But it's worse when you're talking to somebody else and they go do something that makes you uncomfortable, and they look at you and they're like, no shame, right? It's like, that's a cringeworthy thing that's like, oh, I, like, I cannot trust that person. Like, that, it makes it hard whenever people experience shame in different ways. But as I was preparing for this message this week, who knows the show Dukes of Hazard? Who remembers that? I feel like I'm on the very bottom edge of like, I was old whenever I was watching it, but I loved it growing up. It was my favorite show. And the sheriff, the, the police officer on that show, his name was Roscoe. And he had, a, he had a saying that he always said, shame, 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 everybody knows your name. And I think the reason we're all so locked down, put a mask on, is because we carry this shame that's not from us, but our fear is that our shame, shame, shame will make everybody know our name. And then our name becomes associated with that shame, shame, shame. And that's what people connect with us. And so as we talk about it today, of whether we have lots of shame or we have a little bit of shame, we have to deal with our shame so that we can take our mask off, we can be the real us, and we can actually grow in our relationship with Christ because we're dealing with the things that brought us our shame. Okay, so that's where we're going with today. And if we talk about, okay, what does the Bible say about shame? If we kind of, that's our goal. Well, the Bible talks a lot about condemnation, a little bit about shame, but we see the concept of shame be introduced really early on in the Bible, in Genesis chapter three. And in Genesis chapter three, leading up to the scripture is Adam and Eve. We all know Adam and Eve. They're the first two people in the Bible. And Adam and Eve are at this place where they can eat from any tree in the garden. God's like, hey, you have this whole, you have this whole thing. Eat any of the trees, eat from any of the trees besides this one right here. There's one tree you can't have, and by just coincidentally, that's when free will enters, right? Because God's not going to control us. He's going to give us our free will. And so he says, all these other trees are all yours to eat. Just don't eat from this one. Well, the serpent, which is Satan, we know to be the devil, comes and he tempts Adam and Eve and says, hey, you can eat from this. God just doesn't want you to eat from it because he knows if you do, you're going to end up kind of like him. He doesn't want you to. And so God's keeping his thumb on you by saying, don't eat from this tree. Well, in our free will as human beings, Adam and Eve went and ate from the tree. They eat from the tree, and at that point, sin enters the world. And as we're going to see in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, shortly following it after sin, is its very common companion of shame. So let's go to chapter 3 of Genesis, verse 7 through 13. This is what happened after Adam and Eve ate from the trees. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. 
And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree in which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman you gave me to be with, she gave me the tree and I ate. Which, I've only been married for a year, but I would highly recommend not trying that tactic. (laughs) Verse 13, And the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? And just like that, sin enters the picture, shortly followed by shame. You know, because Adam and Eve do the one thing they're not supposed to do, right? And what do they do? They go hide from God. Immediately after they, eat, they ate the fruit, what happened? Their eyes were open. And I think sin has a way of doing that. Sin has a way of opening our eyes, exposing us to things that had we not sinned in that way, we wouldn't have been exposed to. Right? But because their eyes were open to something they hadn't seen before, that's what brought in the shame. Because as God's walking through the garden looking for him, he calls out to Adam, and Adam's response here is that he says, I hid myself. I hid myself. And I think that that's such an interesting thing for us to unpack with the rest of the time that we have together. Because all Adam did was eat fruit. And by eating fruit, he found out that he was naked, so he had to go cover himself up, and he hid himself. But you would think if it was really about eating the fruit, he just would have went, popped a piece of gum in, chewed, and pretend that he never had the food. Right? So how did he get from, I did something wrong, to I need to hide myself because there's this thing that's fundamentally wrong about me? And that's what shame is. Shame takes us from, I did this thing wrong, to I am wrong. And we're going to kind of talk about the difference, what shame is. We're going to talk about what shame is, and then we'll talk about how do we live a life dealing with our shame. Okay? So here's what we need to know. That shame comes from condemnation, and is about who you are. So if we really want to deal with the shame that we have in our life, if we really want to be like, you know what, I want to take this mask off, I want to be who God designed me to be, then I have to say, you know what? The shame, it comes from condemnation, and it's about who you are. Because like I said, the thing that Adam and Eve did wrong was eat fruit, not be naked. But they instantly went from, I did this thing that's wrong, to I am wrong. Adam didn't pop that piece of gum in, No, he went and he hid after he sewed fig leaves together. He was hiding who he was. So why? Because the devil gets us to this place that we believe that the things that happen to us, the decisions we've made, the sins we've committed, the sins other people have committed, are not just sin, they're a direct correlation to not even what we've done, but to who we are. That's his greatest tactic, that he's going to attack us and say, hey, the things you've walked through, whether your own fault or someone else's, No longer is that something that happened to you. That's who you are. We don't just sin. We become our sin. Right? That's what shame does. You didn't just sin. You become that. We didn't just have terrible things happen to us. We are the terrible things that happen to us. We didn't just make a mistake. We are a mistake. Right? That's the lie that shame puts into our head. And I need you to hear me say that shame isn't from God. Shame is from Satan. Shame is from the enemy. Shame is not God's tactic. And we'll see that here in a little bit. But you need to hear, shame isn't from God. And so, if we say, okay, shame's not from God, and I know that the shame that I'm carrying for what I did or what was, happened to me, like, I know that since that's not from God, like, I guess I can just, do I just get a carry on? Like, I can just keep on doing the thing I was doing, or I can keep on walking through that, right? I don't even have to address it. I don't have to change that, because it's not from God. No. And that doesn't mean that I get to choose my flesh over my spirit. That doesn't mean that I get to continue on doing what I want to do. It just means that my response to the things that I've walked through, whether mine or somebody else's decisions, my response isn't shame, because what I've done or what someone else did to me 
is not who I am. That's not what the Bible says. So then what should my response be? Because we're all going to feel something when we sin, when we make mistakes, when we mess up, when someone else sins and messes up against us. We're all going to feel something, right? What, what is that feeling that we should feel? Well, we need to feel guilt. And guilt comes from conviction and is about what you've done, right? That's the question that got asked. What have you done? He didn't say, who are you? Why are you that way? That wasn't the question God asked. God's question was, what have you done? And the feeling that we have afterwards should be guilt. Because guilt is based on an action. If you think of the court system, think of the court system. When people go to court, what are they tried based on? Like when somebody commits a crime, they're based on whether they committed the crime, did the action, or they didn't do it. So you're either innocent or guilty. You're not innocent or shamed because it's not about who you are. There's a lot of good people who might be in jail because they were convicted wrongly. There's a lot of bad people who might have been not convicted of the thing that they didn't do because it was based on the crime that they did or did not commit. Guilt is based about what did we do because that's what the Holy Spirit's there to do. The Holy Spirit is there to bring us conviction. Right, so we should have conviction that gets me to feel guilty about the thing that I did so that my life changes, my heart changes, I repent and I turn back to God. But it needs to be, hey, that thing that I did, I shouldn't do that anymore. Not, hey, because I did that thing, I'm a terrible person. Or because that thing happened to me, man, I am like, I'm just the worst. Like, I'm worthless. Like, I can't be used. Nobody could use somebody like me. No, if you look at the Bible, the Bible is filled with God using all sorts of people who have been through really hard, challenging things, who have made really poor decisions because at the end of the day, it's not about just who we are. It's about what we've done and we allow the Holy Spirit to convict us, to change us. And the reason before we got into anything else, it was important that we know the difference between those two things is two reasons. One, because maybe you're new to this whole Christian thing or maybe you're just checking it out today. Like, we have to know the difference between the two because shame is not God's character. Like, if we walk around our whole life thinking that, well, I'm a bad person, I'm a terrible person, I'm worthless, I'm terrible, I'm whatever, and we think that that's from God, then we're misjudging God's character our whole life and we don't have, we're already living disconnected from God because we're allowing the world to tell us what God thinks of us instead of looking at his word, right? And so we have to understand, one, that shame is not God's character. But two, we need to know the difference because unless we don't have a heart, which we all do, unless we don't have a soul, which we all do, like after sinning, after making mistakes, after going against God, we're all going to feel, feel something. And we need to know that what we feel should be guilt, not shame. But also we need to know the difference between the two so we can stop our conviction that brings guilt from turning into guilt that brings shame about who we are. We have to know where to draw the line so that we can move forward and be all that God has called us to be. Okay, so with the rest of the time that we have, we have about 10 minutes. Now that we understand the difference between the two, how do we live a life for God but dealing with our shame, right? We've got to deal with our shame. We all have to. Some of us may have already dealt with most of it. Some of us may have never even thought about dealing with it and we're like, oh, if I could leave. If it was darker in here, I would leave, right? But the reality is we all have to deal with it. So how do we do it? Because if we want to take the mask off and be the real us, how do we deal with our shame? All right, our first point, we have three of them. Our first point is that we have to have a relationship with God. Sounds super simple, but none of the rest of anything else is ever going to work if we try to deal with our shame without God. It's not designed to be dealt with without God. Nothing that we walk through in life really is, but shame certainly isn't because we have to go to God to find out what does he really say about us? And is shame from God? And how do we deal with it? And I can't process all the shame and all the things that have happened to me, all of my sin. That's why he sent his son to pay the price because I can't pay the price. I can't process all of that. I can only process one sin. I only have one life to live. I can only process one sin. And so, for all of us, we have to continually go to God, but we have to begin to build that relationship with him. And when we're in relationship with God, we see there's no condemnation. 
And if we remember that condemnation is what brings us shame, right, about who we are, then we have to go, let's see what the Bible says. And if we look at Romans, there's two verses in Romans. The first one is Romans 10, 11. Paul wrote this. He says, for the scriptures say that whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And so Paul's even telling us that if we believe in Jesus, if we believe in God and we have a relationship with him, we won't be put to shame. He's already separating relationship from God here, shame over here. Two separate things. Shame is from the earth. Earlier in Romans, two chapters before, in Romans 8, he says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. And I think that's so hard for us to believe because we can feel so overwhelmed by our shame and our condemnation. And maybe you've never had a relationship with Jesus and you're like, well, that's great, but I don't know that I'm in Christ Jesus. I don't know that I believe on him. So what do I do now? I would encourage you that this is the best decision you could ever make. Give the keys of your life over to him. Repent from your sin. Surrender your life and start to walk with Jesus. Start to walk in relationship with him. And I think that's the best decision any of us can ever make. And as we make that, as we begin that relationship with him, that shame that's overwhelming us, if we give it to him, will begin to dissipate over time as we hand it over to him. But the same is true, I think, for us who would say we're Christians but still overwhelmed with shame. Right? If we're still overwhelmed with shame and we would say we're Christians, I think part of it is because we tried to handle it on our own. It's just like we talked about earlier with the song here again. We took it out of God's hands. Right? We said, well, let me, I, I got it. God, I don't need you on this one. I can do it on my own. And in the process of that, we become a God unto ourselves. But we're not meant to handle it all on our own. And so we have to start that relationship with him. But the hard thing about relationship with God is that we live in a sinful world, and sin naturally creates a distance between God and us. Sin naturally kind of creates separation, and that's that's Satan's goal, to separate us from God through sin. And so if we're not careful, if we allow it to, sin will push us from God further away from him. And we see that play out in our story in Genesis chapter 3 that we talked about with Adam and Eve. If we go back to Genesis 3 verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. You know, because of their sin, they separated themselves from the presence of the Lord. Right? Right? because of the shame that they felt, because of what they realized when their eyes were open, because of the things that had happened based off the decisions that they made. They said, I gotta, I gotta separate myself from God. The shame that I feel is just too much. No way he loves me. No way he's like, no way God could ever forgive me for what we just did. He said one rule and we broke that one rule. So because that shame they felt, they put this gap between them and God. But thank God that that's not what God wants for us. Thank God that he's going to still pursue us. We see in verse 9 of Genesis chapter 3, it says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to to him, Where are you? And I think for those of us who are really deep and feeling ashamed for our decisions or the decisions of others, I would tell you that you might be hiding, but God's saying, Where are you? God's still walking around. He's asking, Where are you? He wants relationship with you. No matter what you did, he still wants relationship. No matter how far you went, no matter how bad you messed up, no matter what it is, that the lie in your head that you're believing, God's still asking, where are you? And the one thing I love about this is, you know, God's not dumb, obviously. It's not like Adam and Eve were like the best at hide and seek ever and God just couldn't find them. Like God's not going to force relationship with us. He will pursue us, clearly. Even after they broke the one rule, he's still pursuing them. Hey, Adam, Eve, where are you? Where are you? But he didn't go back behind the bush, pull him out, and say, I knew you were hiding. Why do you think you could hide from me? Like, I knew you were going to screw up. Like, you are a screw up. Like, I can't believe that you made that sin. You're just, because of that, you are now just like, I can't even use you. You are just a complete mess up because of what you guys did. No, he said, where are you? And then when Adam came to him, he just said, what have you done? What have you done? 
And I think if we can say, if we can get to the place where in our relationship with God, we say, man, he is pursuing me. No matter what I've went through, no matter what I've walked through, he's pursuing me. And I do have to deal with what I've done. I'm not sitting here telling you that we don't have to deal with the things that we've done because we do. But we have to deal with what we've done, not just who we are. Because all the decisions we've made, the sins we've had, only affect what we've done. It doesn't mean that it changes the identity that God gave us. So, if we can say, you know what, I need to deal with my shame. I do. And part of that is I need to either rekindle my relationship with God or I need to start my relationship with God. I need to make sure that I focus on that. Then a product of that relationship with God becomes my ability to trust Him. Right? Like, I have to be able to trust him, which it should be easy to, but yet the world tells us that it's hard to, really hard to trust God. So if I can build my relationship with him, then I can do our second point, which is believe what God says. Believe what God says. And once again, sounds so simple until our circumstances look different than what God's word says. And it's like, well, how would I believe that? How can I believe that his word says that if everything else in my life, all of my senses, tell me that that's just not true? But we have to believe what his word says, and that's talking about what he says in his word in the Bible, but also what he says specifically to you through his spoken word through the Holy Spirit. Like the Holy Spirit will speak to us. And what does his word written in the Bible say? What does the Holy Spirit say? But how would we ever believe that? How do we ever know to believe it? And how would we ever even have the mind to get to a place where we can believe it if we don't have relationship with him? Because someone I have no relationship with is not going to have any chance at changing my mind on anything that I've believed my entire life. And unfortunately, the thing about shame, you didn't start believing that negative thing about you today. You started believing it years ago, decades ago, when you were five, when you were 10, when you were 15, at the point in which you sinned, at the point in which that thing happened to you, that's when you started to believe it. And from that point until today, you've trained your brain to believe that because of that, I am this. That's the way that shame works. Because of this, I am that. And now we have to be like, oh my goodness. So I've got to believe something that I spent my whole life not believing about myself? How in the world do I do that? Well, I got to dive into the word and see what the word says about it. Because as we saw those two verses in Romans, there's no condemnation. There's no shame in him. But we also see in Galatians chapter four, verse seven, we have to believe that therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. And if we believe that God's perfect and we believe that we are his heir and we are his son or his daughter, why would we believe that he would treat us the way and think about us the way that we think about ourselves and even treat ourselves through shame. We have to get to the place where we can say, you know what, I believe that I'm no longer a slave to that thought process. I'm no longer a slave to that title, to that thing that I've placed on myself or other people have placed on me and I began to believe. Because that's not what God's word says about me. It says there's no shame. There's no condemnation. There's none of that in Christ Jesus because not only am I in Christ Jesus, but I'm a son or a daughter, and I'm an heir of Christ. We also have to believe what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Sorry, this is going to go five minutes long, but you're already sitting down, so hopefully it's okay. I have to believe that what I've walked through isn't who I am, and when I came into relationship with God, the things that I've walked through now aren't just who I am, but the things I've walked through now are past and they're gone and I'm a new creation in Christ. And if I can't believe that, I will always believe the title that I carried for my shame, but I have to get to the place where my shame is dropped when I start that relationship with Jesus and I can go to the word of God to find out that that shame is dropped and I can walk into the new creation that he has created me to be because the Bible says that he washed me white as snow. Like, white as the purest snow. He didn't wash me white as an old dingy t-shirt that you've had for years. He didn't wash you white as cream. He washed you white as snow. And I think so many of us say, yeah, he washed me, but I'm only like gray. Or I'm not completely white as snow. 
Like, I'm, like so, so many of us see ourselves as a snow that's been driven on on the roads, and it's kind of brown, and it's kind of chunked up, and, well, I can't be used, and I'm just certainly not, like, no, we are white as snow. He separated us as far as the east is from the west from our sins, and so if we find ourselves back over here in the east with our sins, a lot of times we've walked ourselves back there, or we've allowed Satan to walk us back there through shame. And so I'm telling us we have to be in the place where we have relationship with God to know that we can believe what his word says so that we can deal with our shame. And we talked about the Holy Spirit earlier, but if we believe what his word says in the written word of the Bible, we also can believe what the Holy Spirit says because in John 14, chapter 26, it says, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I've said to you. And so as we find ourselves bogged down by the thoughts of our sin and the thoughts of the world and our flesh and what other people said about us and what we think about ourselves and what Satan's chirping in our ear about, we have to go back and say, I need to know the Holy Spirit's voice because the Holy Spirit is the voice of truth. John sixteen thirteen, our next verse. However, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. The spirit of truth is the Holy Spirit that comes from God. It's not, my opinion doesn't, it's not my opinion that will guide me into truth. It's not the voice of shame in my head that's going to guide me into all truth. It's not the flesh. It's not the world. It's not any of that. It's the spirit of truth, which is the Holy Spirit. That's who guides me into truth. And so I have to know what the Bible says. I have to know, to get to know the voice of the Holy Spirit so that I can allow the Holy Spirit to work out the shame in my life as well. So that we can do number three as we close which is share your story. And that's where everybody freaks out. When it comes to the things that I've been through, the things that I've done, the things that have been happening to me, what do you mean share my story? Like, I don't want to relive that. I don't want to talk about that. I'm not telling you to relive it all in every graphic detail and everything that happened, every decision you made. I'm not telling you that. But I'm telling you there are people who, are walking th- who will walk through the same thing that you're walking through today or that you walked through And yes, to deal with my shame, part of the healing of that is to be able to say, I'm comfortable enough to take off this mask because I don't care if people know what happened to me. I don't care if people know the decision that I made because I'm confident enough to take off the mask, know that that's what happened, that's not who I am, know that because I'm in relationship with Christ, I'm a new creation, so I don't have to carry that anymore, and I can go out and share this with other people. And think about it, if somebody would have been there to share their version of your story. What happened to them with you, right? If somebody would have been at the place where they shared what happened to them with you, how much would that have helped you walk through the things that you're walking through? I'm not telling you, when I say share your story, I'm not saying go take out a full page in the newspaper, write a book, start a podcast, like none of that. You can, like if that's what you feel the Lord leading you to, but I'm just saying be ready for people to come up across your path who need to hear your story. Like, God doesn't just happen to be really good at creating coincidences, right? Like, those aren't coincidences, they're divine appointments. And if you are willing, and you have to have a relationship with God and believe what his word says before you can do number three. Don't start sharing your story until you get number one and number two down. But once we get number one and number two down, share your story so that we can get to a place where you can help other people through and other people don't have to live under the bondage that we've all had to live through because maybe somebody didn't share it with us. Because that's where true freedom and true victory comes from. And if you can remember back to the beginning of this message, which is longer than normal, so maybe you can't. But if you can remember back to the beginning, we said that shame is a result of the condemnation that comes from Satan. And we know Satan biblically is referred to as the father of lies. Well, if we can nail these three things, relationship with God, believe what he says, and share our story, if we can get really good at those three things, then not only do we just defeat the shame that's in our life. Not only do we deal with that, not only do we not have to carry that weight anymore, but we can actually get to the place where we can defeat the father of lies. We used this verse probably a month ago, but Revelation 12, 11 says, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, right? We can't overcome our shame. We can't overcome Satan without having relationship with God, right? So we have to have the blood of the lamb. Relationship with God comes through the blood that was shed by Jesus. Jesus is the lamb they're talking about there. We have to have that part down. But then it says, and by the word of their testimony. So you want to deal with your shame? You want to help other people deal with their shame? Then share your story, the word of your testimony. Because that's what helps other people. Like we say all the time, but we need to make sure that we 
embrace it. And Garrett talked about it last week. This life isn't about us. This life's not just about me having an easy life, not, not just about me making sure that I can live the best life that I can. No, it's about other people. And if what happened to me could help one other person, why would I not be willing to share that with that person if God crosses our paths? But I can't share it if I've still got my mask here because I'm not willing to deal with shame. And so I know it's a heavy message. I know that you all were excited to come to church and then we just talked about shame for 40 minutes. But if we want to have true relationship with Jesus, if we want to be at the place where I don't have to walk into church feeling like I can't be myself, I can't, certainly can't walk into small group. I've got this mask on. I've got to make sure I'm on guard at all times. If we're not willing, willing to deal with our shame, we'll always live with a mask on and we'll always miss who God has called us to be because we're so busy trying to be who the world says that we were. And we'll always miss God trying to be the world if we are embracing this concept of shame because the world's always going to tear us down. The world's always going to speak death over you where God will always speak life. And so I want to encourage you guys this week, like in your prayer time, like just ask God, like what areas of shame? Some of us might know right now without praying about it where you feel ashamed. But I think that that is a great place for us to start as we dive into three more weeks of this series. And I promise they won't all be as heavy as this, but um, this was a message I just felt like God placed on my heart and I couldn't, I couldn't be disobedient in sharing it. And so let's, let's, let's pray this week that God will remove that shame from us, but let's all pray together uh, here before we hop back into worship with one last song. God, we, uh, we thank you so much for how good you are. God, that you are a God that loves us unconditionally. God, that you are a God that cares so much about us. God, that you sent your son down to the cross so that we didn't have to live with the shame that comes from the decisions that we or others have made. God, we thank you that in your word we can find the truth about who you are. God, we can find the truth about what you believe about us. God, that we can find the truth that is we don't have to embrace the shame that comes at us from the world, from others, and ultimately from Satan. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit that does bring conviction so that we don't have to continue to walk in our sinful decisions. God, that we can turn from those and turn back to you. God, wherever we're at on our spiritual journey, God, we just ask that you would allow us to to begin or to renew or to continue to walk in a relationship with you. God, knowing that if we don't have a relationship with you, God, we can't accomplish anything against our shame or anything that you would have for us. God, we have to have a relationship with you. God, give us the faith. God, give us the strength to believe what your word says. Give us the ability to recognize your Holy Spirit's voice over the voices of the world. And God, finally, we just ask, Lord, that as you bring us divine appointments, as you bring people across our path, God, we ask that once we're ready, we can share our story to help other people who have been through the same thing. Father, we love you, and again, we thank you for how good you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. Amen. Stand, let's worship with one more song.
to be in relationship with us. He wants to do life with you. And that's a promise from his word right there. And I challenge you guys as you start off this new week, you start off this new year, as we talked about today, growing in relationship with him. If, if you feel distance from God, who moved? So have a great week. We love you guys. And uh, have, a, have a good one. See you guys. Thank you.